Ryan, thanks again for joining me on our Thought Leader Spotlight series. I'm your host, Matt Camp, head of partnerships for Deal Machine. On these, we really like to shine a a spotlight on industry experts like yourself to hear your inspiring stories and really educate our our audience on your lessons learned and how you see the world evolving. So uh, today, I'm really excited to welcome on Ryan Dossie. Um, You've bought 150 rental units in the past two years. You're the founder of Call Porter, the founder of Ballpoint Marketing. Um, Call Porter does 10,000 plus calls a month for investors. So you can kind of speak to a variety of strategies there. Uh, You also mentor students who have done over 500 deals last year, and you yourself regularly have uh, six-figure months with wholesaling and flipping and then seven-figure businesses. So really excited to to talk to you on such a wide variety of things today, Ryan. Welcome on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. These are always fun to do. Yeah. And, and together, I'll, I'll try to dig in today on, um, you know, just cash flow, uh, you know, wholesaling, direct mail, a variety of things there. But um, to kind of start, I'd like to get a little bit deeper than just your standard bio. So can you maybe tell us a little bit more about your 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 journey, especially on the investing side and um, really kind of a few pivotal moments that have got you to, to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the start of my story is the start of everybody's story who's in real estate. Of uh, I had a job I didn't like. Uh, somebody told me to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I got really excited, but Rich Dad, Poor Dad told me nothing. Like I didn't know what to actually do. I liked this concept of my money working for me, but I didn't have any money. <laughs> so it was kind of like, okay, where do we go from here? Um, and that actually led me to bigger pockets. I remember Google searching like, uh, books like Rich Dad Poor Dad. I was like, I need more of this kind of content, and I found Bigger Pockets. And it's funny, you can find my old posts on there that are like, if there's a dumb question anybody ever had about getting started, I asked it, down to like, what's a contract? Uh, I don't have any money. How do I do this kind of thing? And uh, <laughs> so that would have been probably back in 2014. Um, my that was my last year as like a W two employee. And um, I made 22 grand pre-tax that year. So real, real broke. And I partnered with a coworker of mine. Uh, We dropped about 3,000 yellow letters. Uh, The guy who sold them to us, we actually had to insert and lick them ourselves. (laughs) Like that was not included in the price. Yeah. Um, So I put my like 1,500 bucks on a credit card that I couldn't afford to pay off at the time. Uh, It's kind of one of those like, don't do as I did, <laughs> you know, necessarily right, right. things. Um, but we got our first deal within about 30 days. Uh, it was a property that we wholesaled. We had no clue how to do it. I mean, I took earnest money in cash from the person who was buying it. Um, I threw it on Zillow as a for sale by owner to sell it. Uh, but long story short, we made right at 12,500 bucks. After expenses, we were holding the check for 10 grand when that would have taken me six months of my life to make. So I kind of had a big like light bulb moment of not trading my time for dollars, but getting paid based off the value that I was able to generate. So that for me was like a real big eye opener. Um, I did what most people did then. And I kind of just like side hustled it for a couple of years. I decided in 2016, like, I'm going to jump, I'm going to take a leap of faith. Um, I had $3,000 to my name and $3,000 a month in bills. And I was like, "Ah, it's go time. Um, And somehow we didn't go broke. Uh, That first year, 2016 was horrible. Uh, I want to say all in all made like 30 grand and every dollar of it went back out. Uh, Mm -hmm. The next year though, is where stuff started to click. So 2016, I did six deals. 2017, I did 74. Um, so went from like your struggling wholesaler, which I think there's a lot more of those out there than we (laughs) acknowledge or than we support necessarily. And I got better buyers. I got more consistent in my marketing and I set bigger goals. Uh, 2017 after all expenses and everything, I netted like 300 K and I was like, wow, this is fun. Right. I paid off all my credit card debt. Um, you know, we're having a good time. End of 2017, we started buying rentals. I think we closed on our first four. 2018, we closed on something like 70 units. 2019, we closed on like another 70. Uh, 2020 on, we've been focusing more on the transactional side. So wholesaling flips. Uh, In February, I've got like a virtual wholesaling business that does deals in markets all around the country. They did five deals. 
my main markets in Indianapolis and we had 16 deals there. So uh, February we had 21 deals. So that's kind of where we started versus how we got to where we're at now. Yeah, man, you, you guys ramped up quick. Like what, what was uh, in that 2016 to 17 period where you went from, you know, the six deals to, to multiple a month, like, um, you know, looking back on it, what were some of those things that accelerated that so quickly? Like, how were you able to, to pull that off? So uh, one of the things I talk about a lot is figuring out like your function equation. If you remember those from like back in grade school, like you put X into the machine, what comes out the other side. So in my market back then, I had to spend about $2,000, $2,500 on marketing to get a property at 75% minus repairs. Um, so I read Grant Cardone's 10X book. I think the only book by Grant Cardone that I liked. Um, and I was like, okay, I did six deals. Let me see if I can do 50. I didn't even 10 X it. I was like, let me nine X this. Cause there's no way I can do 60. And I literally just reverse engineered how much money do I need to spend on marketing to do that? And realistically what it looked like was there's 52 weeks in a year. If I wanted to do 50 deals, I needed to send $2,000 worth of marketing every week. And um, I'll be blunt, like I have been before, that wasn't my money. That was American Express hooking a brother up uh, for the first like month or so. But then we got kind of this like economy of scale built up where I, I wasn't able to maintain that level of marketing because we had so many deals. Um, so that was real big with it. And then the other thing that was real pivotal, I hired a business coach at the end of 2016. I was like, I was pretty depressed. Uh, you know, you're in real estate, you're getting these big checks and all the money goes back out and everyone around me looks like they're crushing it because I'm only seeing their highlight reel right. and I'm like barely making my mortgage payments. And I remember I told my wife, I was like, I need, I need help. Like I, there's obviously something I'm doing wrong. So I hired a business coach and one of the big things he helped me focus on was uh, like, what did you do today that was revenue generating? So uh, every single week that we had a call, it was like, did your mail go out? Okay, what else are you doing with your free time? And then there was a lot of just like busy work that I was doing that wasn't making me money, but felt good. So, you know, I'd hop on bigger pockets and answer questions and ask questions and listen to podcasts, but I wasn't following up with my leads. Um, I dig through my email a whole bunch, but I wasn't you know, following up with people who told me no, because I didn't like conflict. So there's just a lot of that kind of stuff that we got dialed in. And uh, I tell you, with the right systems in place, it is very easy to make six figures a year in real estate. I mean, it's just, it's uh, what at one point was like, there's no way I'll make a hundred grand a year is now like, you know, that's our, our monthly minimum goal. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I mean, I think you're, you're so good at, like you said, putting those systems in place, really understanding your numbers of like, Hey, you know, if I know it's, I'm going to make, you know, it's going to cost me, you know, two to three K per deal or, you know, 22, 50 or, you know, that number, then, Hey, uh, I have the systems in place and the confidence to know that I can spend, you know, 10 times that and I'll get the same output. So can you maybe walk through newbies around how to put those systems in place, how to get to that number, how to, how to foundationally set up your, your business. So that way you do have that confidence to spend that, that amount. Yeah. So um, I'm way more comfortable when I'm working with somebody and they're like, Hey, I'm going to drop 10 grand in the direct mail. I'm like, even if you're an idiot, you're going to, you're going to at least recover your investment. Um, I think one of the challenges that I've seen with a lot of the newbies is they hear other people's highlight reels and they think that that's what's typical. So like I did a bigger pockets podcast with one of the guys I worked with who did six deals on 2,500 pieces of mail. So if I'm a newbie, I'm like, okay, cool. 500 deal machine postcards. And I'm making $10,000. Right. And then they're like, I've sent 500. Why have I not got anything? It's like, well, that's potentially an outlier. Uh, what I've seen is really the average. So I work with people literally from Los Angeles to New York, all the hot markets in between, you know, your Nashville, your Dallas, the places where people are like, oh, you can't find deals here. The average that we're seeing is 2,500 to like 3,500 bucks. In some of the hotter markets, it's closer to like 5,000, but that's our typical costs to find a deal. 
but that's average. And that doesn't include like driving for dollars or something like deal machine. I know you guys have your own metric of how many properties added, how many times. So I think it's just kind of like somebody's listening to this, they can take my numbers and okay, this is what's average. This is what I should expect. Or, you know, Hey, deal machine says 600 properties mailed, you know, five times or whatever it is. Um, I think it's really just trusting that process. The biggest piece of advice I can give somebody who's new with this is you've got to be looking for the opportunities. Um, I'm pretty cynical. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, very like dark sense of humor, very easily in the past. I was very, very much somebody who would hold on to something. Like if it upset me, I was your guy that would be like, all right, I think this deal machine thing doesn't work. I'm going to try it just to prove them wrong. But deep down, I hope it works. But like, if that's the attitude you're taking into it of like, geez, Ryan told me 2,500 bucks. I spent $2,500 and don't have anything. It's like, well, that's the average. So you might spend $5,000 before you get a deal, but then you might get two on that last campaign and boom, you're dialed into the average. So um, the one thing I tell people like that are interested in working with me is if you're not like sold out on this of like, I'm going to make this work, I don't want to work with you. Like you have to approach this from the standpoint there's thousands of people way dumber than anybody watching this that are making a lot of money in this industry. If they can do it, why not you? If you don't get into it with that attitude, you're not going to, you're not going to make it. It's just kind of been what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. So say if they do have that attitude, they do have that mindset. Uh, I know in the good your, one or the bad one. <laughs> the, the, hey, I'm good. I can do this kind of mindset. Yeah. Like they, if they have fixed that yep. uh, and have the right mental approach and have, you know, the tenacity to follow through with all of that. Um, you know, I, I know in your create cash flow ebook, you talk about, you know, the Burr method and how mm -hmm. that grew you to the, you know, 150 plus units and like 9 million plus in assets in two years. Yeah. Um, can you kind of give people that framework of, you know, the Burr method and, and maybe some lessons learned that you've kind of tweaked yeah. your process over the years? No, absolutely. So the Burr method, if you're not familiar with it, stands for buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. The, the big focus on it is you have to get a really good deal. So um, most people actually recommend 75% minus repairs. I'll go a little bit further. Uh, we do 75% minus repairs minus the holding costs. Um, if you're not budgeting for that five to six months that you're not collecting rent, you're not going to be able to refinance out of all the deals. Um, I've got a pretty big pet peeve with a lot of like the TikTok, Instagram guys that push the burn method because they're like, I did it with no money. Well, you might have been able to like refinance out your cash, but you had to pay for your marketing. You had to pay for your CRM. You had to pay for your holding costs before that refinance came in. Um, so we do 75% minus repairs, minus holding costs. Um, we're using private money, uh, literally paying like eight to 9% interest. Uh, people are like, who are your private lenders? They're private. Like that's not how it works. These are like mom and pop type folks. Um, I've never done it with hard money. Hard money to me is just too risky. I'm, I'm not going to pay. Early on in my career, I worked with somebody that was like an equity split who funded my deals. And it ended up being like, if I calculated it out from a percentage, it was a terrible deal for me. So I ended up moving on. But I was never in the position that I had to pay somebody, you know, $5,000 a month and holding costs on a property or something. Um, so, you know, the, I think most important thing with that strategy, get full-blown inspections done so you know everything you're going to have to fix um, get multiple bids from contractors make sure they're itemized so you're comparing kind of like to like and realize that all of them might not go perfectly you're going to go over budget i mean shoot even just right now like getting construction done i don't know how it's at where you're at matt but we're remodeling the master in my own house and i've got a couple other several other projects going on, but even just the master in my own house, we ordered one window back in March. That's not going to be here till May. Uh, we yeah. ordered a tub in the end of March that was supposed to be here April 8th, that they literally emailed us April 8th and said, it'll actually be April 18th. Um, so we've been dealing with all these delays and stuff. And the, the one thing I hate to see with people trying to use the Burr method is somebody's painted this picture of it's no money down, no risk. 
-hmm. There's a lot of ways you can blow that process. So just make sure you have reserves, I think is the, the big takeaway. Yeah. Are there, when you say there's no ways that it could potentially, you know, fall apart or your numbers not line up, are there any ones that stand out where you're like, Hey, keep, you know, keep this in mind right away or try to avoid this or that? Um, yeah. So I would say, you know, early on, I was kind of like, I just want units, right? I want units. And then it was like, okay, well, I have favorite units and I have things that I look for now. Um, with me personally, like I'm looking for properties to buy here in Florida. Um, I'm actually closing on one on the 20th, so next Tuesday. Nice. Um, and with that one, what I look for now, I call them like the vinyl villages. So newer, nicer, attached two car garage, three beds or more. Um, the properties I can tell you that were just horrible that we should have never touched. Uh, a, they were ones that we skipped inspections on. We were like, oh, we walked with our contractor. We know what we're getting. And then contractors like, yo, whoops, <laughs> I missed this, 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 and this. Uh, so that's one. Um, I, I personally am only really interested in properties that are three bedrooms or more. You have a two bedroom house and somebody gets pregnant, that property no longer works. You have a two bedroom house and somebody's boyfriend moves in, that might no longer work. Uh, somebody needs to work from home, that doesn't work. Three bedrooms, you're kind of like, I feel like just your tenants stick around longer. Um, I will not buy another property ever again that's on radiators. Uh, had a five unit I did that we've now called our project from hell that just like you'd plug one hole or one leak somewhere and another one would blow in a wall. And it was like, holy crap. We ended up after we'd finished our remodel retrofitting in uh, central heat and AC. So like building in bulkheads, cutting through walls. Cause it was like, we're not, I can plug 500 holes and 300 more up here. Um, so I don't do anything with radiators. I also really don't buy properties with plaster walls anymore either. Um, tenant hangs something, it's a pain, you know, it cracks. I just, I feel like it's for a rental property, it's hard to keep it in good shape. And unless you're planning on taking it all down and drywalling eventually, Mm -hmm. It just doesn't necessarily make sense. So those are um, that. And then I look for places with private parking. Um, I ain't parking on the street. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. um, I also look for places with dishwashers. Uh, a quality resident is not going to wash their dishes by hand and stay there for five years. It's just, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my focus is on like the somewhat newer, nicer stuff. Um, like first time home buyer -y neighborhoods is what I'm looking for. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like your strategy has kind of evolved over time too, where you said now you're doing some more transactional stuff. And then obviously, you know, 20, you know, 17, 18, 19, you were doing a lot of the, the, you know, burn method type, you know, stuff. I mean, I know on your YouTube channel, you say, Hey, I, I keep the best and wholesale the rest. I love yeah. that approach. Um, can you kind of tell me, you know, one, why you have take that approach and then two, how that's kind of evolved over time. Um, you know, through the years and in, in the market? Yeah, good question. Um, so keep the best wholesale the rest. I think a lot of buy and hold investors view or flippers, even like view wholesaling as dirty. And I think it's kind of an ego thing of like, that's beneath me. Like I, I actually, I actually invest. I close on deals. I was like, bro, bite me. Um, here's the thing. You start to do direct to seller marketing and you're going to have people that call you on stuff that you do not want. Uh, it's in a bad part of town. It needs too much work. Uh, it wouldn't cash flow, whatever it is, right? So I fully believe that you can have a rental portfolio, but you also need a transactional side of the business because you're going to have stuff come into your lap that you'll leave a fortune on the table if you don't monetize it. Um, you know, 2017, we bought all those units, but we also did like 600 K in wholesale and flips. So it's the, I view that as like the engine that kind of gives you the play money to do other things. I mean, how I look at, how I look at real estate now, my rental portfolio is my retirement plan. Like that's my 401k, the wholesaling flipping, that's my now investing growth money, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I do it. Um, how it's evolved over the years, um, I would say I've gotten a lot pickier in what I'll buy. And I'm much more interested in like 
financial freedom, lifestyle, spending time with my family. Yeah, early on, I had all these like dumb vanity goals, right? I want to get to six figures because that sounds cool. And then it was like, I want to get to seven figures. And then it's, I want a hundred rental units. And now it's like, you know, um, I just want to be able to spend time with my family, have more than enough liquidity, have retirement taken care of, make impact and enjoy life. Like I don't, I don't need to be a billionaire. Um, you know, I don't need to have 5,000 units, right? If I end up there, cool. But I think it's, I don't know, I'm just a lot more interested in being present and spending time with people I care about than I am with kind of chasing these goals. Cause I've learned when I hit one, I just set another one. Mm-hmm. Um, like my car is a good example. My car guy, it's how I found real estate. Um, I set the goal of buying my first Ferrari before I turned 27. I did it like a week before I turned 27. And for years, it was my like, I'll be happy once I hit this. And for like two weeks, it was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Don't get me wrong. It's still cool, but it's like, it's just a car. (laughs) Like, so I don't know. That's kind of my advice. Like go after what you really want, not what people tell you you should want. Um, So, you know, if you're not into watches, wear an Apple watch. You don't need a Rolex, right? Um, if you're not into cars, don't go buy a Ferrari. Like your Acura is great vehicle. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Go after what you want. Not what other people tell you you should want. That's a, that's a great quote, man. I think that's yeah. going to resonate with a lot of people on here. So, um, yeah, I mean, do, do you think, uh, and uh, I mean, a lot of people listening to this are in that wholesaling, you know, game, and then maybe, yep. uh, you know, I love that kind of diversified approach. If you've got the short-term and the long-term strategies together, um, for those wholesalers listening to this, I know you, you've mentioned before, um, there's kind of a, a six figure, uh, hamster wheel exercise that you've done before with people yeah. and going through that, it sounds like there are a lot of expenses that, that they may or may not, um, be aware of that they can, can cut pretty easily probably. So are, are, are there any lessons you've learned from that exercise of like, Hey, here are some of the places you might be spending money or might be, uh, you know, uh, not maximizing your profit, um, you know, that kind of low hanging fruit. Yeah, good question. Um, So the first thing I would say, and I think you kind of mentioned it last, is I didn't get out of debt by budgeting and cutting out my Starbucks. I got out of debt by, let me figure out how to make a lot of money. Right now, I did have to understand what got me into debt in the first place and get realize that I don't spend money I don't have. But I wasn't, you're like, okay, if I follow the Dave Ramsey approach and I just cease to exist outside of my house, I can pay off my stuff. You know, for some people, that's a great approach. For me though, it was like, let me figure out a way that I can have my cake and eat it too. And that led me to real estate investing. That led me to being able to do a thing. I've got a flip I'm doing right now that uh, we're going to net to us like 75, 80 grand. Things ugly. Didn't even do a good job on it. It's just in a super desirable part of town. We got a great deal in Carmel, Indiana, right? Like, you start to get deals like that and life's a lot more fun. Um, early on when I really struggled, I just wasn't valuing my time enough to negotiate good enough deals. So I remember being like, I'm going to make $3,000 on this. Like that covers my bills for the month, but like, that's it. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was to push that. Like your minimum, any, anybody I'm working with, I tell them your minimum, shoot for eight to 10K minimum. And then when you're selling the deal, see if you can push the, your, you know, we don't, we'll shoot stuff out at 75, 76, 77% of ARV. We don't really overprice stuff, but if people bid it up from there, I ain't going to fight them, (laughs) right? Like I wouldn't buy the deal at that, but if that's what they want it at. So it's, it's very, very easy. And I got this from digital marketing to dramatically increase um, the profit of your business by focusing on like those simple levers. So if you can focus on your closing percentage, if you can go from 10 to 15% of a, somebody calls you and you get the property under contract, you're making way more money. If you can take your average profit per deal from $5,000 to $7,500 and you're doing 10 deals a year, that's literally uh, 50% more money in your account at the end of the year without doing any extra deals. So, you know, I think it's looking at things like, is there places I can lower uh, expenses or overhead? I'm not a shiny object person, right? Like 
I'm not constantly, okay, what's the, there's not a tool that's going to make you successful. Like deal machine's great, but if you don't put in the work, you're not going to get anything. Yep. Uh, you know, my direct mail company is cool, but if you don't work your leads, you're just setting your money on fire. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. It's not going to do the work for you. Yeah. You got to do the work, mm-hmm. but it's, I'm not constantly chasing that. Like, well, it's going to make this easier. What's going to make this easier. I'm chasing what works, what's consistent. What do we know? What's repeatable. And I mean, deal machine is one of those things. That's why you guys have grown so much, but I would look at like, okay, are you paying for stuff? that you're not really using, um, you know, are you like getting monthly subscription to death? But even then it's like, okay, you dropping deal machine to save a hundred dollars a month. Cause you're going to door knock properties or something instead. Isn't really the right attitude to have it's if on the deals you're doing, why don't you split closing costs with sellers? Instead of saying you pay all closing costs, everything's negotiable in real estate. That right there makes you an extra thousand dollars a deal. If you're double closing, tell your end buyer they're required to pay all of the closing costs. That right there saves you another that you've now added two thousand dollars to a deal without having to do another one. It's like those simple kind of levers that if you start to stack up, um, I mean, use the expression six figure hamster wheel. It's very easy, in my opinion, to make six figures a year in real estate through wholesaling or flipping. It's hard to get to multi six figures or seven figures because what got you to six figures won't get you to seven figures. You've got to dial stuff in and optimize and like kind of double down on what's working. For anybody who's watching this as a wholesaler, my biggest piece of advice, the hardest part of this whole game is finding the opportunities. So when you have the opportunity locked up under contract, you had better maximize that. So like for wholesalers, my biggest piece of advice is start to wholesale some stuff, buy it, close it, turn around and list it on the market. I've got, uh, the one that like blew my mind on this. I had a property. I could have wholesaled for 36,000 bucks. We took it down, listed it on the MLS. It sold in four hours. We made 89 grand instead on the same opportunity. So it's, you know, making sure that you're getting everything you can out of your business and not leaving stuff on the table. We've even had some buyers like, come on, man, I bought a deal from you before. Let me get this one cheaper. And it's like, no, <laughs> like that's not how this works. So uh, that's kind of just my advice around that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you spoke on wholesaling right there. You, you have a couple other uh, kind of more creative, um, you know, wholesaling type uh, strategies. Like you talk about virtual wholesaling, uh, reverse wholesaling. Can you maybe dig into uh, each of those, like starting with virtual wholesaling, your framework and process for, for how you go about doing that? Yeah. So uh, virtual wholesaling, we're primarily using SEO. So inbound leads, people that are wanting to sell, um, it's not a volume play, it's a quality play. Um, but you know, we've got one, normally what we're doing with that strategy that's unique is we're typically either just paying cash for the property, turning around and listing it after doing like minor cleanup stuff, or we're using like a lease option strategy. So we don't actually have to buy the property until like a week or two before closing. Um, and that allows us to not have a ton of cash out risk on some of these deals. Um, that one's a little trickier because it's a little like trying to explain to somebody how to do SEO to rank for keywords in random cities is, is a little bit more involved. Yeah. Like it's complicated quick. Yeah. Yeah. But I will say if you're marketing in your own market, you're going to get a random call. That's like, Hey, do you buy in this other state instead of being like, no, sorry, I don't be like, let me try it. Um, I'll give the guys in our coaching group a little bit of grief because they'll be like, I got a deal in this market. Who wants it? And I'm like, why don't you try it? Like, I love that you guys are sharing with each other, but like, maybe you give it a shot and just see what you're able to do with it. Right. Um, so that's kind of what we do with the virtual stuff. I personally love reverse wholesaling for newbie wholesalers. Um, ethics are important to me. And I personally struggled early on with like the I'm telling somebody I'm going to buy their house, but I'm not going to buy their house. I don't know who's going to buy their house. I don't have the money to buy their house. So that was something we did a lot of in 2017. I would get the opportunity, take a whole bunch of pictures of it, flick it out to a couple people that I trusted. This didn't go out to like my buyer's list with, Hey, what do you want to pay for this? And 
I would then go back to the seller and negotiate it. I didn't have to run comps. I didn't have to estimate repair costs. I just simply had to negotiate the deal. That was it. Find the deal, negotiate the deal. I love that strategy for newbie wholesalers because you're not doing the, all of us that are established hate newbie wholesalers that are putting stuff under contract, overpaying for it, then pulling. Because it just, it makes the industry look bad. It's going to bring in additional regulation and laws. But on top of that, like you're not helping people. So I'm a really big fan of that strategy till you kind of get comps and repair costs dialed in. And how I did that was asking my buyers, how did you get to that number? I wouldn't have been anywhere. I, I thought you would have been way higher. I thought you would have been way lower, right? That kind of helped me get like my, my gauge figured out. But then what I realized is these guys I was reverse wholesaling to, you know, I'd make eight grand. They turn around listed on the MLS and make 40. And I was like, all right, I'm leaving money on the table here. So, you know, that was when we started to move more towards wholesaling, wholesaling and flipping stuff ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was curious of, of, uh, you know, whenever you were actually sending those out to those few people you trusted, like yeah. what, what was that? Uh, what was the criteria they were asking for? Was it simply you were just taking pictures of the property or were they ask you to gather other information or, uh, it was super low tech. So it was a Google sheet with the address, a link to pictures and my notes from the appointment. So I would be like, this looked like this, uh, this looked bad. I took a picture of it. You can see it here. Uh, you know, basement smelled a little damp, didn't see any mold or anything, but I would just, you know, a couple paragraphs and we still do that when we sell deals, we would, we'll, we would put out a hundred to 150 pictures of every property. What that's resulted for me now is my buyers know that if there's a problem, I've taken a picture of it. So the guys that are on my list that have bought from me more than once or twice, if I shoot out a deal and they like it, they'll just send me a contract. Like not contingent, just, you know, here it is, let me get it. Because they know if there's like, hey, the foundation looked a little weird, I'm gonna have a picture of it. I'm gonna have a picture of us right up on the wall with like, hey, this looks like it bows back a little bit. Like, so it's kind of that just full disclosure was how we did those. Um, and they would just come back. Literally, we had another column in the Google sheet doc with their offer. And they would typically give me a range, you know, ah, 20 to 30 or, you know, 110 to 102 kind of a thing. And how I got paid was anything I could build in beneath that. Um, and I had one guy who would wholesale stuff and would split it with me. So he'd be like, I want to be between 20 to 30. And I knew the cheaper we got it, you know, the cheaper or the more money I was going to make. So that was kind of the approach. Um, the big question I get asked about when I share that strategy is how do you find those people? Mm -hmm. Honestly, networking. Um, you look at like, if you search, we buy houses in your market and look who's got the top websites that come up. Chances are those guys are going to be pretty legit, pretty solid to work with. Um, you know, I always hear people with kind of like the scarcity mindset. Well, they're just going to steal my deals. Well, if that happens, you just stop working with them. Um, I've never been screwed with the exception of one time with one person and everybody else I've done it with. It was a great experience. So, uh, do I work with that guy anymore? Absolutely not. But it's like, overall I'm up way more than I was down. So yeah, um, that's kind of how we've done that. Yeah. And, and then when you're actually communicating with the seller, like what, what is that? What does that pitch look like? What does that negotiating process look like? Do you have any tips same, there? same way most wholesalers are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all right, I got to check with my business partner and run these numbers and I'll come back and let you know where we're at. Right. Hey, chat it over with my business partner here where their concerns, bam, 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 bam. Uh, based off of knowing that we have to fix all this stuff. What do you think is a fair price? Oh my gosh, nobody's going to pay you that much money. Uh, how'd you get to that number, you know, is trying to get them to give the number first. I'm not, uh, I did like the hardcore one call close sale thing before I got into real estate for a while and I'm good at it, but it like, I hate it. So I'm not your like, all right, I'm gonna lock this up on the spot guy. I'm very much your like, Hey, I'm going to go out to the property, take pictures. Um, I'll give you a call within 24 hours with our offer. And then we're making that offer and then we're following up on it. Uh, one other thing we do that's kind of unique, we don't tell them what their house is worth or how much it needs in repairs. Because if you tell somebody your house needs $20,000 worth of work, they're always going to tell you, oh, my buddy can do it for eight. You're a liar, right? So what we tell them is in order for me 
to remodel this property with my contractors to my standards, it will cost me X to just give them a, a dollar idea of roughly the kind of capital improvements we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The reason we do that, if I say your house is worth a hundred, if you ask five realtors what a house is worth, you're going to get five different answers. And if one of those is higher, they think you're dishonest. So we don't get into that. Same thing with like construction costs. If they hit me with the, oh, this isn't going to cost you 35,000, Ryan. I'll be like, look, your buddy you pay in Natty Light might do it for cheaper, but he's not going to give me that deal. I've got to use my guys that do all of my stuff. And this is what it's going to cost me. Knowing that I need to put $35,000 into this to make it work. What do you think is fair? Or, hey, the best I can do is this. Uh, one of my favorite deals I ever got, the guy wanted 100K. I got it for 8,000 bucks. And I went out, walked it. It wasn't a bad house. It was solid, but needed a lot. But I was doing that, like, what do you think is fair? And he was like, oh, I'd like 100. And I was like, that's mm -mm, no. And he was like, 90. And I was like, he was like, 80. And I was like, dude, we're far apart. And he was like, 70. And finally, he was like, just give me a number. And I was like, dude, I'm at like eight grand. And he's like, there's no way. And then like three days later, he called me back and was like, all right, I'm like, cool. So that's just kind of been my approach. It's, I believe in running businesses that are like without blame. And if I'm not lying to somebody intentionally or unintentionally, you know, that's why we focused on reverse wholesaling until we had the capital to close if we needed to, or until we had the private money to close if we needed to. I'm not telling somebody their house is worth this when I know fixed up it's worth this because I don't want them to talk to somebody else and that person make me a liar. My reputation is too important to me for that. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this is uh this is phenomenal, Ryan. Like the 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 actionable steps from this, people are gonna gonna really really enjoy. So I uh, appreciate That's you giving the goal. Them. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not not just big theoretical stuff, but hey, go out there and do the X Y Z. So. Um, I also love that you yourself, you're a, a serial entrepreneur, like you've got, uh, you know, multiple businesses going on, even outside of real estate. So uh, one of them is called porter.com. We'll include a, a link that in the bio as well or into the uh, description. But um, can you tell us more about like why you started that company and, um, you know, why outsourcing something like, you know, taking calls is a, is an important strategy for investors to consider? Yeah. So um the Marriott model is how I look at it. So the guy who started the Marriott hotel chains never wanted to own hotels. Uh, he actually started as like a snack cart kind of a thing. Uh, he noticed when people were traveling, they'd get off the plane and they were hungry. So he met that need. And then he realized, well, where are they going to sleep? So then they met that need. Um, how Call Porter started for me, I worked in call centers from the time I was 17 until I was like 20, 21. Um, good at it, but I hated it. And I realized I didn't get into real estate to be a call center employee or to do that work myself. And I was missing calls. I was letting stuff go to voicemail. The like straw that broke the camel's back for me in 2016 when I was broke, had somebody call in, uh, it was Friday night, I was at dinner with my wife. I'm, I see the lead coming in and I'm like, ah, it's not worth the fight. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'll hit them back on Monday, right? Because, you know, I'm a good Midwestern boy. We don't work Sundays. Uh, so I, I don't take the call. The guy's voicemail is like, hey, Ryan, you know, got your piece of mail. Uh, my brother passed away and left me this house. You can have it for X. And X was like, holy crap, that's a screaming deal, right? So I'm like, like waiting for Monday morning. I'm going to lock this up. I'm going to make like $25,000. This is the one I need. Like, let's go. Call the guy on Monday. And he goes, yeah, uh, it's already sold. And I was like, well, what do you mean? You just talk, you just Friday night at like nine o'clock. You hit me with that voicemail. And he goes, yeah, I called you and I called another guy. The other guy took the initiative to answer the phone. So I sold him the house and I actually sold it to him for less. And I was like, oh. <laughs> like that is not what I needed to hear. So I was like, okay, I don't ever want to feel this way again. So uh, I hired somebody who I used to work with and had her start to take my calls. Um, screen for equity, motivation, condition, and anybody who wanted a cash offer, push them to an appointment for me. And that was going really well. And then I noticed like, well, there's times I have two calls coming or comes in after her shift or she's sick. So I hired a second person. And then I talked to a couple of buddies. I was like, this is great. Like I'm doing mail, I'm doing deals, but I'm not taking the, you know, take me off the list, telephone, tough guys. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I don't need to repeat any of the words we've all heard. Um, 
And so they were like, well, can you take my calls? And it grew to the point that I started to have to spend more time managing this accidental call center I'd started than in my real estate business. And I decided I either need to close this company or I need to hire somebody to run it because I want to focus on doing deals. So I brought my brother, Justin, in uh, to come and manage it. And now we've got like 25, 30 uh, folks that work for us. We're taking anywhere from 10,000 plus calls a month for a couple hundred companies across the country. And it's only real estate investors with folks here in the US. So uh, it's huge. Yeah. Nice. Huh. Do you, uh, are there any best practices from, you know, from the, the, you know, uh, from how to interact with a call center like that, or how to interact with someone on your team that's taking calls that you can share? So, I mean, the big thing that I think is different with us versus like a Pat live, like an answer first or something. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not like, oh yeah, so-and-so is not here. Let me take a message. They, they act like the front desk of my company and they'll enter them into my CRM. I use Resimply. And they'll try to push it to an appointment for my acquisitions guys based off of their availability. So what I noticed before, because before I started Call Porter, I tried Pat Live, I tried several of the other ones and somebody would call in, they'd get a good voicemail and I could just never get the person back on the phone. Um, so my approach that's different than a lot of guys, my rule of thumb, if they have equity and they want to sell, regardless of their asking price, let's go meet with them. I've bought more houses from people that called in with your like, yeah, your market's really hot. Everybody wants this place. If you want to pay 10,000 over retail, be my guest. I bought more houses from like the unmotivated tire kickers than I can count. Um, don't get me wrong. I get like the desperate calls that we all love of like, I just, I need to be out in two days. Like sweet. Um, but most of my deals I'm making offers I'm following up with and they're taking a little bit of time to pan out. So I would say big piece of advice I have would be more just working leads of a lot of investors be like, well, I need to screen this before I go meet with this person. You know, I need to give them a ballpark figure to, to see if they're going to sell at like a deep discount. That's not my approach. Um, I tell the guys I work with, you don't get to get picky about who you're meeting with until you've got more deals than you can handle. Uh, it's funny. I'll meet these new wholesalers that have never closed a deal. And they're like, yeah, that one wasn't worth my time. And I'm like, bro, right now your time is free. <laughs> like you're not making any money. Like you, you don't get to be picky until you've got more opportunities than you can handle. Um, so our approach, we meet with any, as many people as we can, we make offers on everything. And even if they tell us no, in the most vulgar way possible, we still follow up with them um, till they tell us to stop calling. So, yeah, that's, I mean, I mean, it sounds like, like you said that, uh, you know, that, that lead generation engine, if you have that going, if you can figure that out, that's going to, uh, you know, feed a lot of the rest of what you're doing. And, you know, that's, you know, step one is that, and then you can figure out like, Hey, yeah, what, what, you know, can I negotiate from here? How do I, how do I kind of, you know, build out the rest of my processes, but yeah. Um, do you think, and I don't want to run too far over on you, Ryan, but, uh, on the ballpoint marketing side. Is that something that we love teaming up with you within the deal machine app? Like if you actually send a ballpoint letter through deal machine, you know, that that's uh, you guys helping us out there and us teaming up together. Yeah. Um, you know, I know some people might think like, Oh, direct mail is an kind of an old school method. Like it's been around for a long, long time. Right. Uh, can you talk through why this marketing channel still works and, and, you know, maybe a few best practices on your wording within those mailers that you recommend people use? Yeah. Uh, good question. So I'm in several mastermind groups that are guys doing a million dollars or more a year in real estate, uh, which that's like top percent of most investors that you're going to hang out with. The big thing 95% of these guys have in common is they're all doing direct mail and it's one of their most consistent deal sources. Um, so definitely still works. We actually saw an increase in effectiveness as folks jumped over to SMS marketing and cold calling and text blasting and all that, um, because there was less competition and, uh, with like carrier changes and stuff with SMS and cold calling, we've actually had a lot of clients that were doing those methods, hit us back up and be like, Hey, this just isn't working anymore. My delivery rates trash, my deal flows trash. Uh, like what, what can I do? So our approach, we kind of borrowed this from Facebook, like customer experience is our number one priority. 
So I'm not sending any of this dishonest mail. Like I've been trying to reach you. This is your final attempt. Your cash offer is expiring. Like, no, uh, we're marketing from a brand. There's this, like, there's all this old school, bad advice that I still hear. Like, you know, don't market as a company. People want to work with individuals. Amazon ruined that, right? Uh, if somebody's going to look at reviews before they buy toilet paper, you don't think they're going to look at reviews before they decide to sell you a house or not. It's so easy for me to obliterate a competitor on a deal who doesn't have a brand. Cause I'm like, here's our credibility package. Here's our BBB accreditation. Here's some of our reviews. Here's us at the closing table with five other sellers, just like you. Here's a contract versus like, yo, my name's Matt. Here's this one pager I printed off from online. Like it's so easy for us to just build in value and why we're legit or not. So um, one thing that we've been doing that we've had a lot of good success with lately, focusing on selling your house fast. Doesn't make a ton of sense right now. Cause they're like, well, I can put it on the MLS and it'll sell this afternoon. So that's not unique. You're not unique to me that you can buy my house fast. Hey, I can buy your house for cash. A lot of cash buyers buying retail right now. That's not super sexy. So what, why would I deal with an investor if I can get more money and sell just as fast on the open market? Okay, uh, you can sell without realtor commissions. All right, that's interesting. We've done very well with that call to action lately. The other one that we've been pushing is being able to sell as is, or not as is, being able to leave what they want and sell on their time frame. So we've done a lot of deals lately where, you know, uh, they don't want to clean the house out. Like they're going to leave it with a couple dumpsters full of stuff. Or uh, we've got one that closes on Monday that we're doing pretty well on. I won't share the number in case one of your followers is who's buying it from me. Um, but the seller needed a certain amount of time to get out. So we gave them two or three weeks. We bought the property, but we're holding back like $20,000. I'm also in Indiana where they're not going to let this guy stay there for free forever. So like to me, that was worth the risk. So it's kind of, we're just being more flexible as investors right now, but I would caution against using those older call to actions that might be, it's like if you're marketing to prettier houses and your approach is I can, you sell it as is. They're like, as is, it doesn't need anything, right? Um, you know, so make sure your call to action makes sense for the asset you're chasing. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan, again, this was phenomenal. I, I really, uh, you know, I, I know we're out of time here today. I would love to do another follow-up with you because I'd love to dig, oh. especially on the brand side. That's really, really interesting. I don't think too many people touch on that around yeah. building credibility like that. But, um, again, thank you so much for your time today. Um, how can our audience get more involved with you? Like we'll, we'll link to the, the things we mentioned in this description, but, um, for people that, that I know you have great YouTube content, can you maybe give a few places, uh, for people yeah. to follow up with you? Um, I mean, best place for more like my actionable stuff, like how to do this, how did I do that deal is all YouTube. If you want to hang out with me more personally, I'm most active on Instagram. That's where you have like, you know, my like more day in the life type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but if you guys hit me up on YouTube or on Instagram, I'm really good about getting back with folks. Um, so that's the best place to find me. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much, Ryan. And I uh, really enjoyed the conversation today. Likewise, man. This was a pleasure. Yeah. To everyone watching, uh, this is Matt Camp with Deal Machine and happy deal finding. Thank you.